Hi, I'm Izzy Mare, and I'm an undergraduate student in the Sustainability and Contemporary Studies departments at Dalhousie University and University of King's College. I'm also a cluster student at Situating Science. This is the second episode in a series of podcasts complementing the upcoming Hype and Science event happening at the University of King's College on December 7th. Hype and Science, or How Can Respectable Journals Publish Such Crap?, will take the shape of six case studies of overselling, misrepresentation, or biasing in the presentation of scientific research. Voices from Harvard, UBC, Elsevier, and Dalhousie will be presenting case studies from their own fields and fueling discussion by casting a critical eye towards the peer review process. The process of the rise of a paper to celebrity status will also be under scrutiny. Is the search for breakthrough papers verging on fetishism? And how will trustworthiness in research be ensured in the context of the current collapse of the peer review system? Today we're talking with Dr. Rosie Redfield of the Zoology Department at UBC. Dr. Redfield is also the head of the Redfield Lab and the author of the RR Research blog, with a special interest in the question of whether or not bacteria have sex. Dr. Redfield's hype and science talk, titled The Arsenic Life Debacle, will be centered around the generation of shaky facts due to shoddy methodology by respectable research hubs. She will be using the NASA-supported research, which claims that some bacteria can build their DNA with arsenic instead of phosphorus, which is being hotly contested amongst chemists as a case study. So, Dr. Redfield, why is the question of the role of arsenic or phosphorus in the role of bacteria's construction of DNA critical to the field of zoology? It's not critical to zoology, per se. It's really critical to our understanding of how all organisms, not just animals, all organisms work, bacteria. This work was done with bacteria. Um, I think the results were most important not for what they found, but for the fact that what they appeared to show was possible because the authors were only looking at one obscure little bacterium and reporting that some of its phosphorus in its DNA had been replaced with arsenic. But the, the hype for this arose from how it was presented as a, an example of what life could be. This was work funded by NASA's Astrobiology Initiative. And it was, its goal was to see, could life be constructed out of different chemistry than we have now? And that was why it was considered to be so exciting, was because it seemed to show that, yes, we could build DNA using a different backbone molecule. So... Dr. Redfield, you're said to be one of the most diligent critics of your own field. Um, Could you comment on why this kind of self-critique is necessary? I don't do it because it's necessary. I do it more out of a personal sense of outrage that, wait, this is wrong. How could somebody be wrong about this? Um, And I certainly think that science will progress faster if more people are openly critical of each other especially in Canada, we often tend to take kind of a what I call the, the Bambi school of scientific criticism. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And this is really unfortunate because scientists are wrong a lot. This is, there's a, I just saw a poster. It was like, science, if you aren't getting things wrong, you're not doing it right that we, we're not just at the frontiers of science, we're at the frontiers of our abilities, and we should be in a position where we're making mistakes. Because if, if we're not risking making mistakes all the time, we're only doing things we already know the answer to. There's no point to that. So we, we need to be comfortable about making mistakes. We need to be comfortable about helping others to realize when they've made mistakes because we can't count on ourselves to know that we've made a mistake. Um, Are there any biases that can't be addressed through the critique of one's own field? And are there any ways of addressing those biases if they exist? Well, we're we're totally biased about everything Um, in our own field. in, In everything we do, we're biased. And what makes science work is that we at least in the ideal situation, we do our best to deal with those biases by putting them out where other people can say, no, your biases have caused you to think this, but you're wrong. Of course, we don't say your biases have caused you to think this. We say, oh, um, 
you know, there might be another interpretation to this. We try to be polite and positive, but at the same time, we have this formal structure of putting our ideas at risk, submitting a journal article to an editor who will send it to reviewers who will do their best to see where we're wrong. And that's, that's the very positive, striking thing about science, that this negative force of saying that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, builds this very positive body of knowledge. But without the constantly hacking away at our biases, exposing our biases to criticism by other people, I mean, we just do things wrong all the time, constantly, and we wouldn't know we were wrong. We certainly try to critique our own work. We take our draft article and we put it away for a week and then we read it again and we go, this is crap. Or, oh, actually, this is pretty good. But we, we know that we can't individually identify our own biases very well. And, and that's why we put our work out for other people who, who also have biases, but that we try to make sure that we're not giving it to people who share our biases. And that's, that's a hard, brave thing to do, but that's what makes science work. That's actually a great segue to my next question, which is, uh, could you comment on the role of non-traditional presentations of research, such as blogs, Twitter, and other social media platforms, as opposed to, to the traditional format of peer-reviewed journals? What I'm seeing now is not successful things opposed to peer-reviewed journals, but I'm seeing an enormous, really kind of thrilling blossoming of social media enhancing peer-reviewed journals. Um, just two days ago, there was a paper about comparing male brains and female brains, and it got a lot of publicity saying, oh, for the first time, look, all these dramatic differences, how Male brains and female brains are so different. But within an hour, that paper was being dissected on Twitter. It got, I'm sure it got the usual formal peer review before it was published. But as soon as it was published, scientists were saying, wait, do you think this is right? What's, are there problems with this paper? And initially, it might be somebody who was not an expert in the field, but very quickly, it was picked up by people who were experts in the field, and they were tweeting, and they were pointing to each other's um, commentary that they'd written on their blogs, or here, somebody had graphed the data a new way so that you could say, oh, oh, that's not good. And uh, somebody else actually wrote a, a storify, which is a collection of tweets, basically, following the story of the discussion of this paper over 24 hours. And it was remarkable to see all the understanding that emerged, even among people who already had quite a bit of expertise, that there was this sort of blossoming of, of networking and understanding being built through social media, um, a combination of Twitter and blog posts. Thank you so much for chatting with us today, Dr. Redfield, and thank you to the listeners for tuning in. For more information on Situating Science and the Hype and Science event, visit our website at situsci.ca. That's S-I-T-U-S-C-I dot C-A.